Okay. I guess we're gonna do eight more misconceptions about the climate crisis. Um. Oh my. Skip down. So here's another one, where the real problems lie. A lot of people say, what about energy? What about electric cars? What about um, housing and buildings? But that's not the areas that we really have problems. Nor is it agriculture. Well, there is an area of agriculture. The area of agriculture is emissions from cattle, and that's going to have to be dealt with seaweed, which can reduce 75%, 80%. Some types can reduce 90%, over 90% of the emissions from cattle. So that's great. And they still are they're already being used, but the types that reduce ninety five percent need to be cultivated at scale and we're sure not still not sure that do that. But they've been used for years. If seaweed's been used for years as something for cattle feed actually or feed for animals. So it's not this is not something new. Maybe new to many farmers, but at any rate but the things that are that we're going to be air, going to be problematic are industry, air travel, um, shipping, and excuse me, I'm having another brain fart. No, that's a child's name for it. Stuff for getting something. Yeah. Anyways, those three areas are going to be the areas where we don't have necessarily all the technology really yet, especially aviation. But those three areas are going to be the areas where we're going to be really need to work on. Industry. There's industrial heating. We have some technologies. The biggest one that we can use is carbon capture and sequestration, which basically takes the emissions and then sends them puts it in the ground. That's the biggest thing we have. Other options are nuclear, hydrogen, nuclear, hydrogen, uh, and some other things. One of them is natural gas, which I guess is cheaper than coal now, so it makes sense. But the thing is, it gets me into them. One of them is hydrogen with carbon capture sequestration. I'm like, if you're going to do hydrogen with carbon capture and sequestration, you might as well have just done natural gas with carbon capture carbon capture and sequestration. But at any rate, um, uh, what's the other ones? I forget. The big three are to replace industrial heating processes are processes that are used to create metals, to mold metals, to um, create bricks, you know, big kilns and stuff is what this stuff is used to heat. And usually what's used to heat them is coal, or natural gas. We need to replace them with something. What well, are some options? Could be nuclear, hydrogen, or using natural gas. We're using CCS. There are also ver there are other areas. Another thing we need to do is increase durability of the thing. But back with the in er, and longevity and efficiency. But back with the industrial heating. The most economical one is actually CCS here. And getting these prices down are going to be critical. And trying to develop ways to, to get higher heating levels is also going to be critical. So that's going to be important. Um, another area where the real problems are maritime. As I said, shipping, the biggest area we can, best thing we could deal with that is hydrogen. Hydrogen has been promising with, aid, or with shipping to be used. Um... It has some really good uses. It has some good uses for that. Um, because it's it's a fuel that can be transported, liquid fuel. It's it's a, it's a liquid fuel, and it can be transported long distances, and it can be used as 
Um, I'm not doing so well. But, um, yeah, I'm not doing so well with this. I've, yeah, my brain is not with it today. But anyway, this hydrogen can be used, and so that's probably the best option be, because when you burn hydrogen, you, if you burn hydrogen, you just get water. water. So, um, now aviation, aviation, the, the only thing we really have is biofuels, which causes land competition and other problems that can cause deforestation, and it really isn't that great of a resource because the carbon neutral is only neutral if you replant it, replant it, replant it, replant the same amount of plants, and it's not carbon neutral all year round. You know, during the winter, it's going to have, you're still going to have this, in most areas, you're still going to have that plants, unless you're using something like cellulose. You're going to have competition with the, with local foods, with fo food and other things, and that's not a good thing. So biofuel really isn't that great of an option. It's like a, it's a last resort. And that's about it. We can only offset it and biofuels. There's some amount of hydrogen can be used. And for short flights, we can use some electrical energy. Just like for short, we can, just for short, um, shipping, we can, short, like ferries and stuff, we can use electrical energy. Batteries and stuff. So, and then on the next one, let's take one crisis at a time. Okay. This is not how the world works. We have to peak emissions, like, now. We have... What? How many years to deal with this? We have a decade to, to get our emissions down by 50%. For a 50% chance of staying below 1.5 degrees. We have to multitask. I'm sorry, but we have to multitask. We have to be concerned about this as well. There's two big crises going on. We need to stay focused on both of them. Yes, that may be annoying for you, that may be upsetting for you, but th that's the reality. We cannot, we cannot ignore the climate crisis. We can't ignore coronavirus. We have to be, we have to try to tackle them both. And also, with the tackling the economic depression that created by coronavirus, we can use Green New Deal and climate policy to try the investment to try to restart our economy. So that way they can actually work with each other. So one can solve the other. Um, so you can't ignore this. This can't be ignored. You can't just go off ignoring it. Another one is coronavirus is helping nature. Well, not to the extent it really we wanted to. You know, it's some animals will be coming back and, you know, coming in and, you know, doing, you know, some things. But as fact is, it's not as great as everyone's been saying. It's not that good. The, clean, the air is cleaner, but, and there's been a drop in emissions worldwide. But this isn't an equitable way to solve climate crisis. This isn't a good way to deal with emissions. This is going to sort of jump back. This is going to jump back up when we when we end this. Hopefully it won't go as high as it was before, but it will jump back up. So this idea of coronavirus is helping nature, that's so true. And it's also people dying sort of defeats the purpose of that particular climate crisis because the climate crisis is the reason, the reason why we should be acting on the climate crisis is because people, animals are dying. So when we talk about the coronavirus, the reason we should be acting on COVID-19 is because of people dying. Another people thing people say is coronavirus, or excuse me, the climate crisis is just one issue. It's not one issue. It affects foreign, and that foreign, it affects national security, 
because states that are more famines have more droughts, have more um, have sea level rise, created environmental refugees, um, and you know all this other stuff creates, a, and you could you have less water, less food, and less land, and more population. That is a recipe for national security disaster. That is a conflict of resources, conflict, conflict, economic problems, terrorism can rise from that. You know, that is very weak states, very, very ready to boil. For example, Syrian civil war. That's actually a climate, that might be considered partly a climate impact. Because what brought Syrian civil war to a boil was a 10 year, 10, 15 year drought ahead of it. Part of that was attributed, that was attributed at least partly to the climate crisis. So that a climate crisis, a, a Syrian of wars, somewhat contributed to the climate crisis, not entirely, but partly. It's a bunch of factors that lead to wars, but this can cause more wars, because more deadly or more wars. This is, the Department of Defense calls the climate crisis a threat multiplier. This can also affect our economy. We have fossil fuels, we got sea level rot, fossil fuels not being able to be used because they're killing the, the earth, they're killing humanity. We got, um, that's a bubble. We got s s oceanfront property that can't be used anymore because it's worthless now because of the ocean flooding it out. We have fishing grounds that can't be fished anymore and people that lose their jobs and assets that are going to be stranded because of that that's another economic bubble we have um and a reason of those are also reasons for unemployment agriculture so and then you have agriculture agriculture is going to be hurt too there's going to be some areas that they're going to be flooded or whatever and people that are going to be hurt by that. That's another one. You also have the doubt for all these th th these things. You have tourism is going to be hurt because of the climate crisis and natural disasters and that sort of thing. And you just got more and more and more. You got forestry that can be hurt by by this too. Hunting that can be hurt by this as well hunting industry, and I'm not talking about commercial hunting. Commercial hunting is terrible. But recreational hunting never really hurt the species. Regulated recreational hunting, that is. Um, but at any rate, I wouldn't hunt because I can't, I wouldn't, I don't think I could kill something without being upset over it. Besides, I don't really eat much meat anymore. Anyways, because no what happens, because of what happens. But at any rate, But all of these things, you know, can cause economic bubble. These are economic bubbles. And what happens in economic bubble bursts? Depressions. Economic depressions and recessions. So what I'm saying is, and all, a lot of these can also be agriculture, fishing, fishing, tourism, tourism, what was the other one I said? Um... Fossil fuels, those are also reasons for unemployment as well. Especially agriculture. Especially tourism. So when these fail, when these things, you know, those these are big things that could go and cause economic depressions. So that it could hurt us economically. In fact, the special the fourth national climate assessment said it could uh, lead to a semi-permanent drop in 10% of GDP. That's worse than the Great Depression, and it's semi-permanent. And we then we say, then we say, what about the economy? The economy, you know, the economy will be great if we don't deal with this. No, it will actually destroy our economy if we don't deal with this. At any rate, so the next thing, it hurts public health. Obviously, more deaths. Obviously, where it hurts air, causing more air pollution deaths, causes more death from natural disasters, causes more disease, causes this, causes that. You know, the list of impacts is really, really long. Ridiculously long. And 
you look at that and you realize of all the stuff they can impact. Heat waves, heat related illnesses. Another thing. So it will certainly hurt public health. Okay, next thing. It hurt the environment. Obviously, it will kill animal species. It will, it seriously hurts animal species. The third largest cause is supposed to be one of the, it's supposed to be the third largest cause of extinction, and over a million species are supposed to go extinct by sometime this century. So yes, that's, a, that's also an environmental concern. It's a social justice concern because people that are people that are minorities, the poor, you know, children, the elderly, especially minorities and the poor, they will get hurt more disproportionately. People of color will be hurt more disproportionately of that because of this. So it's a social justice issue too. This is not just one issue. It intersects with every issue ever. You know, universal health care could be considered a resiliency policy for this. But without dealing with the climate crisis, what is this universal health care for? It intersects with the military. It intersects with everything. It intersects with LGBT rights because there it's also a population that doesn't get as much and he's, you know, a socially disadvantaged population. It affects women's rights, too. It affects literally every issue you could possibly think of. It affects immigration because because more people, environmental refugees equals more immigration. More people removed from their homes equals more people immigrating to different countries. So it affects immigration. And I laugh at these Republicans that talk about immigration and don't care about climate crisis because, well, you're sort of pushing more immigrants to your doorstep. So, yeah, it's, it affects everything. Okay, enough on that. Let's go to the next issue. The world's going to end in 11 years. Some people would say that. Now, what we said was not the world was going to end in 11 years. What we said was this long thing. To have a 50% chance at staying below 1.5 degrees, we need to reduce our emissions by 50% by 2030 to net zero by 2050. And to, and that doesn't account for how big these positive feedback loops are. If you want to see with that, go to my... 10 top or big 10 misconceptions on climate crisis. It doesn't account for those positive feedback loops. How big those positive feedback loops? It doesn't account for the um the aspect of equity and assumes we'll be able to pull millions of tons of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with technologies that are still in their technological infancy. But it doesn't mean that the world's going to end by 2030 or 2050. So climate change with climate crisis will slowly ramp up. And as we get worse, at 1.5 degrees, it won't happen immediately. At 2030. It will probably happen around 20... Between 2040 and 2065. Well, that will entail... Mostly or most the loss of coral reefs. And drought, droughts will get longer by, I think, a month. And by droughts, I mean the days that without rain in a year. But, you know, I have, if you, I'm going to do a video on projections where I talk about this more. But then it goes up to three, de or two degrees. Two degrees is even worse. Much worse. That's really dangerous. Hurricanes are 87 times more stronger. They're two or two to three months longer in drought season. Sea level rise at two to three over three feet. Six feet. 
about four or five feet, about four feet to the oval rise, I think. I want to do a projection slide where I'm going to talk about the specifics of this, and so you should probably fact check me with this. Three degrees. Parts of humanity are uninhabited. Or part. Wait a minute. I'm getting this messed up. Three degrees. We won't be able to produce enough food to feed ourselves. Right now, we produce enough food. We just don't distribute it properly. At that point, we won't be able to produce enough food to feed ourselves. Four degrees. Large swaths of the earth will become un uninhabitable. I don't know what happens at five degrees, but it's but bad, really bad. Six degrees is when you lead the human extinction. We by the end of the century we will probably get to four point three degrees. So the next century we'll probably hit six, if we're going on our current current track of emissions and don't stop stop this. So the next century we'll probably end up killing ourselves, or killing humanity. Not this century. Okay, I'm back. So, whoops, sorry. But, the next one, um, what's the next one? Let's just plant a billion trees. Now, I know people, this is going to be on YouTube, so, and then there are going to be people out there that, about, that are going to, and this is the place where this came from, Mr. Beast. Some people think that planting a billion, billion well, all we, what he did was great, just fine. I love that idea to plant a billion trees. Anything helps. That's how we got to look at it. We got to do whatever we need to do to help, but do whatever we can to do deal with this. That's not terrible at all. It's a great, great thing. But there are people out there that think that that's going to solve the climate crisis. Let's do the math, okay? We release about how many tons? I think over 40 million tons of CO2 a year worldwide. Tons. It's a gas. Tons. Worldwide. You know, I say greenhouse gases, and it. Fossil fuels and land use. It's still not the numbers I want. That's not the number of ones I want either. Anyways, I forget what it is, but it's over it's over thirty six point eight billion tons, I know that. It's become a lot harder to search. Whatever, I can't seem to find the answer. But at any rate, um, it's over th over thirty six point eight billion tons.
any rate, so that's a lot. I did the I, I figured out the number. It was I think it was something around forty billion tons, something, something or other, forty eight or something billion tons, including land use. And then I did the math to try to figure out how many trees you would need to plant. It turns out to, for every year we need to plant about a trillion trees a year. If every year we had to plant a trillion trees every year. The fact is we I don't even know if we have the space for that. That's what science is saying. That's why we need to decarbonize. There's no way to get around it. You can't that you can't plant trees your way around it. The fact is it just we just got to do it. It just got to be done. Yeah, we'd have to plant a billion trees, or trillion trees, trillion per year, every year, at a current rate of emissions, every year, to sequester the amount that we emitted that year, just that year. It, that's not going to work. So, yeah. That was a great thing that he did, but people should not say that he solved the, the problem because he didn't. He didn't solve 0.6% of it. Okay, back to what I was doing. Um, so, back to the list. Okay. And then there's another one, one size fits all solutions. A lot of people like say carbon pricing, carbon pricing, carbon pricing. This is the, probably the biggest one this is with. People like say carbon pricing, carbon pricing, carbon pricing, carbon pricing. And almost forget that the same, that carbon pricing alone is gonna, isn't going to solve this. Like I'm a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby and I support their bill, a carbon fee and dividend. But the one article they came out with was, was absolutely ridiculous. It said that it will reduce emissions by 90%, and that's not going to happen. No carbon price has ever done that, and theirs won't either. Because some there are some carbon price, there are car, some carbon pricing systems like Sweden's, which are better than that. So it's not going to do that. It's not. Let's be real about it. It's not going to do that. Carbon pricing would only be that effective if it was over, what, what did the UN say? I think it had to be over 175 for something, and then it had to be higher for, for energy and some higher for transportation. At any rate, it was really high. So, it was like some one of them was over in the thousands per ton. So that's just not going to work. What will work is a combination of regulations, directional policy, funding elements like um, crap, tax credits, loans, grants, programs. Um, and, um, policy systems like carbon pricing and stuff, and climate bank, and all this other stuff. I have a list of climate policy. If you want to get specific, I'm going to have some video YouTube videos on that. So, yeah, there's... This is not going to, that's not going to happen, it doesn't work that way. You can't have one size fits all solutions. So the next one, this idea of that individual solutions and systematic solutions are against each other doesn't make any sense. Um, I think a lot of some, a lot of climate activists may argue about this. I think it's actually, I think it's sort of a ridiculous argument. 
systematic solutions will um, they're the only ones that will get us to net zero. They were only the ones because but I'm not saying that individual solutions aren't important and don't need to be done. But what I am saying systematic solutions will get we're there because not everybody's going to do it. Not everybody's gonna want to or who's gonna be able to, not everybody's gonna be want to do it. You know, some people are just going to refuse not to unless they're required to do it. That's what you need those policies for. And some companies are going to be like that too. Like fossil fuels, for example. Now, there are individual solutions. To get these system solutions into place, people need to put their money where their mouth is. People need the people they can need to act. People need to act on it, not through activism. And not just through that, but, you know, doing other ways to try to limit their carbon emissions. That's why you need individual solutions to have a try to for one to try to have a as much as you can to, to try to have somewhat of a try to drop emissions somewhat to push for systematic solutions to allow them to remove, go easier and actually push for them because if without individual solutions systematic solutions won't ever exist. And then the next one people say deniers of the problem. Actually, I don't consider denialists to be the biggest problem. You know, deniers are the problem, are a problem, but not how people think. The climate deniers are annoying when you're doing some sort of activist work, either online or striking or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, then, then they start arguing with you or calling you names, etc. 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 It can be upsetting. And that can actually get you down. But they aren't the main pro. That's really upsetting. You know, they're trolls. But that isn't the main problem. Greta realized something that, I, that many people in the climate community didn't realize, I think, before then. That it wasn't annoying climate prop the annoying climate deniers that were the problem. Or it, and you couldn't fight climate deniers by arguing with them. It was the silence of everybody else. That was the problem, and it was something that you could fight. Many people in the climate community, including myself, were so focused on, on dealing with the deniers to respond to the silence. We were preaching to the wrong audience. You simply can't change someone like a climate denier because they're consp basically what they are is a conspiracy theorist. In a sense, that's what it is. They will always deny facts, and then and then give their own alternative facts, which are not true. And alternative facts. Instead, we should be focused on people that weren't engaged, or who aren't engaged, the average person, that might ultimately change, and then that might ultimately change people's minds. So, another one. The Arctic sea ice will contribute to sea level rise. Well, you know how when you put, like you put, ice in a drink, how the ice melts but the water doesn't rise. The reason for that is because the ice displaces the amount of water that the ice displaces the amount of water that it would create if it melted. The same thing with the Arctic and the sea ice in the Arctic. That sea ice, when it melts, gives it releases its weight and fills in the spot the density was in. That said, land ice is where we're getting sea level rise from. Glaciers, ice, land ice sheets like Greenland, West Antarctic ice sheet, East Antarctic ice sheet, especially West Antarctic ice sheet in Greenland, they're really concerning. Um, yeah, and it gets really worrying. Another one, problem is humans. This goes back to the eco-fascist thing of coronavirus is helping nature. The problem isn't humans. It's how our society is structured, and how ourselves act. I mean, the biggest, like, of, you know, most of our emissions come from rich people and corporations. Overwhelmingly. If we structured society differently, we wouldn't have this crisis. We could, we could, if we structured society differently so the rich wouldn't be as existent as they are now, this wouldn't be happening as much. If we could restructure it so carbon fossil fuels weren't the 
what weren't the, th the blood of the economy, then this would be different. This wouldn't happen. So humans aren't the problem. It's how we are acting that's the problem. It's something we can change. Okay. Then the next one, the last one. People tell me this all, people say this stuff about the Paris Agreement. And I just go, Paris, yay. But Paris was just a piece of paper. Paris Agreement was great because it brought the two largest emitters in pretty much every country on Earth it's an agree to solve the climate crisis and lower our emissions. But the fact is the climate crisis or the, the Paris Agreement was non-binding, meaning there are no enforcement mechanisms. So it's just a piece of paper. Currently, no developed country is meeting its meeting its own goal, setting up the, the goals it has set itself under the Paris Agreement or the UN's targets. It does absolutely nothing but make another problem, promise, which have all been continually broken, and as a climate, a climate activist, I'm not accepting any more promises. I'm only accepting action. We've heard of too many broken promises. I'm only accepting action. We're tired of this. We're sick of this. And that finishes all the um, arguments that I have written down. Thank you for listening to me. And I'll see you next time. See ya. Bye.